Ross, and I'm Ari Rentals Director of Business Development for North America, and I've been with the Ari family now for over 17 years. <laughs> as a friendly reminder, please send us your questions via the Q&A tab, and we'll get to as many of those as possible during the course of the show today. We are very fortunate to have with us the iconic Robert Yeoman. <laughs> uh, Robert was born in Pennsylvania and moved to Chicago at an early age. After graduating from Duke University with a BA in psychology, he enrolled in the graduate program in cinema at USC, where he received an MFA in film production. He spent several years in the commercial world before he received his first feature break, shooting second unit on William Freakin's To Live and Die in LA. This led to more work on features with directors Gus Van Sant, Noah Baumbach, Roman Coppola, Wes Craven, Paul Figg, Peyton Reed, and many others. But Robert is best known for his collaboration with Wes Anderson and has shot all of his live action features, including Moonrise Kingdom and the Grand Budapest Hotel, which earned him nominations for the Oscar, BAFTA, Spirit, and various other awards. Robert is an active member of the ASC and currently serving on the Board of Governors. He's also served on the jury for both Sundance and Camera Maj Film Festival main competitions. Some of Bob's other projects include Drugstore Cowboy, Rushmore, The Royal Tenenbaums, CQ, Red Eye, The Squid and the Whale, Love and Mercy, and the upcoming film, which I can't wait to see, The French Dispatch. Looking forward to it. Welcome, Bob, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Great to be here, Gus. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, it's great. I miss you, man. It's been way too long. <laughs> yep, yeah, it sure has. Well, maybe cool. when this virus thing's over with, we can get back to work. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I yes, think, please. I think everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> so, psychology and then filmmaking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was it that, uh, you know, drew you to filmmaking at that point? Uh, well, they're both very intertwined, by the way. Uh, but, um, I, you know, when I went to college, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And, um, uh, I tried different, I actually started pre-med, uh, but I found out after a semester of that, that that was not for me. Um, <laughs> so I kind of kicked around and, you know, I was always interested in psychology. So I just out of default, I chose that as a major and, um, but I did get involved at the, in the film program. Duke did not have a film school at that time. We do now, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, they had a, a, a thing that showed foreign films every Saturday night. And, and I'd always loved movies ever since I was a young kid growing up in Chicago. And I was a huge movie freak, but I never really considered uh, a career in filmmaking. <clears throat> anyway, I got involved in this film uh, uh, program at Duke and we showed foreign films uh, Saturday nights and I got hooked. And I just saw a lot of film, French New Wave and uh you know all Italian films and films from all over the world and I, I just just got hooked on films and then uh when I remember quite clearly uh when uh Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange opened in Raleigh uh you being from a North Carolinian in a way uh, you know what I mean I drove over to Raleigh to see it and I was so just uh influenced by that film and blown out when I walked out of the theater I said uh, you know I, I got to be part of this so I uh, really, at that time, there really wasn't a lot going on in North Carolina and uh, film-wise, and, and you had to be really in New York or Los Angeles at that time. It's, of course, it's way different now, but um, this is, we're talking the mid 70s. And uh, so I uh, applied to USC film school and I figured I should go to a film school where I could learn something because I knew nothing about making films. And, Somehow I got accepted there and I went to California and I haven't looked back. <laughs> so that's kind of it in a nutshell. You know, I went Very from nice. psychology to filmmaking. <laughs> Very nice. And uh, out of those foreign films, you know, I'm just curious. I mean, which one really struck you when you saw it? Well, first I was time? a huge Berlucci fan, you know, The Conformist, of course. Any cinematographer will use that one. I mean, it just kind of blew me out of the water. The French New Wave, I was very influenced by, you know, and at that time in America, also, you know, there was film Robert Altman, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, you know, mm. Chinatown, you know, those types of movies were being starting to be made in America. And, and America was, uh, had a whole youth movement that was gravitating away from, you know, the classic kind of studio productions and more indie style films, Hal Ashby movies and 
so I, you know, I really embraced those types of films, uh, Francis Coppola, you know, and, and just really, uh, you know, I, I just love those films so much. And, and that's kind of what my inspiration was. Mm, yeah. Awesome. If you could go back and pick and choose somebody you'd really love to shoot for now, what, you know, is there a particular director you'd love to work with? Uh, who is still alive or <laughs> or not? <laughs> well, you know, I was always a Bertolucci fan. I love Billy Wilder uh, as well. I, you know, I would love to work on a Billy Wilder fan movie. Uh, there's so many great ones. John Huston, you know, I recently been on a whole John Huston kick during the uh, pandemic. I've been watching a lot of TCM and recently watched Night of the, the Iguana, which I'd never seen, you know. Uh, oh. There's so many classics. I mean, uh, Francis Coppola was always one of my heroes and I was actually fortunate enough to actually shoot with him a little bit. Uh, his son Roman had me do second unit on a, a movie, The Rainmaker, that John Toll was shooting. And um, it was uh, really, you know, I, I ended, John Toll ended up going to Australia when they did the pickups, I did the pickups with Francis. So I actually got to work with him, but, uh, you know, that was always a dream for me come true. You know, it nice. was one of the few times, I remember the first time I met him, you know, when you meet big heroes of yours, you know, you, I was so tongue tied. It was just embarrassing. And I, and, and I just remember later thinking, oh my God, was I an idiot or what? You know, blah, 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 you know, but I was so, you know, uh, intimidated by meeting Francis Coppola, but he was actually a very sweet guy. And, you know, um, hmm. <laughs> it all worked out well so <laughs> very nice so how long did you how long were you shooting commercials before you started to make the transition over to uh i would guess about 10 years and i started uh you know uh well i started as a pa actually and uh, i i worked for joe pitka who uh at that time was a rising commercial star and um Joe uh, went on to become arguably the greatest commercial director of all time, you know, uh, and, and, but at that time his career was on the rise and he was young and my job actually, uh, I got hired because Joe's a basketball nut and when it's downtime, they have a hoop at behind Levine Pitka and an alley there. And my job was to go shoot hoops with Joe. <laughs> so, um, you know, as an aside, I was a walk on my freshman year at Duke. And so I, I, I always said that my Duke education paid off in the long run. <laughs> you know, I got, to, that what got me my first job. I could play hoops with Joe. And, um, but then I, I, I went, as I, cause I went to USC back then, you know, we call it the USC mafia and, and basically everybody, you know, if you got a job and then there was an opening at that place, uh, you know, you would call your friends from USC. And so I got called to work at a low budget commercial company and I begged them to let me shoot. And we started doing these low budget commercials. And um, then uh, that led to better commercials and better commercials. And then, uh, you know, it's a long story. I can tell if you want, but I, I ended up going to shoot second unit for To Live and Die in LA. And that kind of led, what happened was Robbie Mueller was shooting the film. And uh, Robbie had been contracted to do another film and we were going over schedule. So when he had to leave to do the other film, um, Billy Friedkin said, okay, you want to take over buddy? <laughs> and so for me, that was like, you know, the biggest break in the world. I was a virtually an unknown. And uh, so the last month of the movie, I was shooting for a student, but you know, I'd been there watching Robbie the whole time. And it was Robbie's movie, of course. Uh, and I learned so much from him. I was so fortunate to have been able to be there. It was like, uh, you know, kind of a dream come true. I was such a huge fan. So um, yeah, no, what a, what a, f <laughs> that's become such a cult classic, that film. And then also to be yeah. able to, yeah, work alongside Robbie Mueller and, and Billy Freakin. I mean, wow, that, that must have been <laughs> well, it was like going uh, to the front of the, the Russian front in a way. <laughs> you know, Billy, you know, I love Billy and he gave me my first break, but he, you know, he was not easy. And, and, uh, back then particularly, and, and he's mellowed over the years, but you know, uh, but it really, I learned so much from him and I, in many ways, owe him my career, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, I, I've kind of kept in contact with him through the years and he's definitely, as he's gotten older, mellowed quite a bit. And, uh, but he, at that time he was crazy and uh, you know, it was a real, after that, I just said, I can do anything because if I can do it for free kid, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, I great. Learned a lot you, from that. 
it's so funny because I, a question I was going to ask you is actually one that came in from the audience just now. And that's about, you know, obviously it's the car chase and, yeah. and were, were you, um, were you shooting that? Was that's that your, what I did? The your, car chase. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, we saved that to the end and uh, Robbie had left by that point. And uh, you know, I, 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 you know, we watched a lot of car chases and to me, the greatest chase in cinema history, well, my people might argue the general with Buster Keaton, but I think it was the French connection. You know, I think that chase with Gene Hackman it, underneath the subway and everything is one of the most riveting, amazing car chases ever, you know, and, uh, you know, I know a lot of people have other ones that they might throw in there, but to me, that's the best one ever, you know. We could just, we could just do a whole episode about, you know, the great car chases of American cinema. You could. <laughs> through you the could. late sixties, all been the way through so the eighties. You know, <laughs> yeah. there's some great ones, but I that's think great. the one that, that really caught me was it had such a strong documentary feel about it. And I, you know, I talked to Billy quite a bit about how they shot it and, and it was kind of, uh, back then people were, a lot less safety conscious than they are today and they are more apt to just go out and create things live and and uh you know also the cross cutting with the the uh subway car the elevated cars i mean it just was brilliant how they put that together and um you know to me again it's to me it's the greatest car chasing ever but you know right. like i said there's a lot of other great ones out there for sure yeah but that I, and that, you know it's a interesting thing because i I think about the psychology, right? Cause you're, you're thrown into the character's point of view at that point yeah. and having to deal with that, you know, and it's close ups of Gene Hackman and then, you know, his POV going down the road and then cut away and the psychology of not only the camera positioning and the editing of that, it just, that's what makes it so impactful and so raw. Yeah. And, and the one thing I learned from Billy is, you know, and before we started shooting it, you know, I remember him saying, you know, sometimes you look at the dailies and they're kind of boring, you know, but it's when you do the cutting and the con, you know, putting shots against each other and, and you cut out the beginning and the end of the take, you know, and, and it's just those two seconds where the camera snap zoomed in or whatever. And, and that's what builds the excitement. And, and, you know, obviously you have to give the editor, the material to do that and and he certainly did but uh you know it, it it he said don't worry if the dailies are a little boring because it's it's gonna be fine you know and not like our dailies were boring but you know it's just it was an interesting comment i thought you know right. and, and that you know you have to look at just the moments that you're going to use as opposed to the two minute take you're really probably going to use you know three or four seconds of that at most you know so yeah uh, and and that's what builds the sequence ultimately so, mm. <laughs> now, a, a more technical question on that front. I mean, back then, um, late seventies, early eighties shooting, how many cameras would you throw at like a car chase sequence like that? Uh, well, it depends. Uh, like when we were on a camera car, you know, oftentimes just shooting in a camera car leading or going sideways or whatever, we would usually use two or three. Uh, but when they do the big crashes, we had crash cams always in the grill, you know, uh, and, you know, I would say probably seven or eight cameras, you mm -hmm. know, and we always, well, we were using IMOs back then and, um, right. you know, uh, our problem, <laughs> you know, I guess I shouldn't say this, but I will. Uh, <laughs> our problem was the IMOs scratched the film so much that we had to put two IMOs in the grill because sure enough, one would be scratching and the chances of the other one not scratching were better. So we always mounted two IMOs uh, in the grill. So it got the POV and when the car smashes into another car or whatever, you'd have that right with the IMO. And they're great little cameras, but we were having major scratch problems with them. Um, and uh, so there's always two IMOs in the grill and then a various other cameras that we placed, you know, anywhere we could that we could get some of the action and um, for the big scenes, seven or eight cameras, but generally two, maybe three. Mm. <laughs> That's really cool. Cause I was always curious, you know, because you see that now, it's, you know, today on films, you know, they'll throw, you know, upwards of eight, 10 cameras easily to, to these yeah. type of units. And you just wonder if that was even feasible back then or how it was achieved. So that's, yeah, that's cool. it was. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, what I found doing stunts and I, you know, I've done a little bit of stunt work I'm in that I mean, shooting stunts. Um, you know, oftentimes it's the camera that you don't expect gets the best shot, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, you kind of anticipate 
oh, this this camera's going to get the best shot here. And then you get the dailies back, and the one that's operated remotely behind a garbage can somewhere, and the car comes and smashes into the garbage can, that has the best shot, you know? And so, so it's a kind of a funny thing, because, you know, as, as carefully as stunts are, 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 are planned out, and they usually kind of happen the way they're planned out, but, you know, there's always some kind of thing that happens that you never anticipated, and, and so it, it's it's a wise thing to do, and, and which was kind of interesting because the whole movie to live and die in was basically a one camera movie because mm -hmm. Robbie comes from that European kind of attitude with there's one place for the camera and, you know, uh, and, and certainly Billy was probably the same way. And, and, uh, but when it came to the stunts, we did pull out extra cameras for sure. You know, mm -hmm. you, you kind of have to in a way, you know, you, <laughs> so. and Billy had been working with, uh, Owen, on several projects prior yeah. to that, and he made the switch to Robbie. Do you know why that was uh, decided? And you know, I don't. Curious. It might have had to do with the fact, and I, I'm just guessing uh, that *Flim and I in L.A. was actually a non-union film, and, ah. um, and and that's how I got on because I wasn't in the union, and uh, so that might have had something to do with it. Um, you know, Billy used to always kind of tease me about, you know, he said, well, 10 years from now, you're going to need 10 trucks full of lights and all this gear. And, and I think he really liked, it was kind of a comeback movie for him in a way. And he really liked the, the, the streamlined approach that Robbie brought from Europe, where it was a lot more minimal lighting and, and uh, you know, uh, whereas uh, I'm not saying Owen would do this, but a, a very a Hollywood cameraman might fly big giant silks and bring in big lights and do all that. Whereas Robbie kind of worked with what was available to him. And I think that appealed to Billy and um, again, a very minimal style lighting and, and coming from a very low budget background, which is what I had, I kind of embraced that kind of style as well. And uh, you know, we only had one camera cause that's all we could afford. So you had to find the right place to put the camera. And, and uh, so, you know, we, I worked it's more similar to how Robbie saw things and I learned so much from him, you know, just yeah. watching him, you know. Well, that must it's kind be. of an older style, you know. Yeah. Today's, well, world, today's world in most movies, except for with Wes Anderson, uh, which is one camera all the time, but most movies, it's always, you know, two cameras, as you probably know. You know so. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. And then you uh, shot Gus Van Sant's first film, Drug yeah. Store Cowboy. Yeah. In the, and that was up in the Northwest. And um, that must have been a really unique experience as well. <laughs> it was unbelievable, really. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, Gus, uh, you know, was a young filmmaker. And uh, when he got greenlit on um, Drug Store Cowboy, the producers, he had some friends, uh, Eric and John, who we wanted to shoot it. But they, you know, didn't have sufficient credits at that time. Uh, they've gone to very great careers, but um, uh, but anyway, he needed a DP who had some credits, and and uh, the producer I had done a part of a movie, a, a video, a Road to Nowhere, uh, uh, with uh, Talking Heads, and the producer said, "Well, I just worked with this guy on this video, you know, let's bring him up." So I I came up to Portland and met Gus, and we hit it off, and. Uh, you know, uh, I love the script right from the beginning. Um, and it just, everything about it appealed to me. I connected with him very much. And, uh, you know, we had, it was like an amazing shoot. We were all a bunch of relatively young kids up there making this movie. And, uh, uh, you know, it was, you know, no one was bugging us. We could do kind of what we wanted. And uh, it was, in, in Gus brought, because he had an art background, you know, he went to RISD and, and uh, he had a, a, a different approach than a traditional filmmaker towards things. And, and so it was really kind of, and I was a little more traditional in how I, uh, I approached filmmaking than he did, but he was constantly pushing to take it out there a little more and, and uh, you know, but it was great. And, you know, of course the film went on to get a great deal of attention and really helped put me on the map as a cinematographer, no question. Yeah. yeah. Was there, I, I always like to hear about, you know, at that time when you're really starting to find um, your relationships and, and your looks and your styles and so on and so forth, was there an experiment that went wrong? <laughs> 
With Gus? Well, in uh, general, during that time when you were um, <laughs> starting. No, uh, let me think. I, I don't recall. You know, off the top of my head, I'm not trying to dodge your question. Off the top no, of my head, okay. I don't remember. You know, I mean, he, he constantly was pushing us to push the envelope a little bit. So, but, you know, what I found, particularly shooting film, is that, you know, and because and, of digital, you, you pretty much see what you're going to get, you know, but with film, you know, particularly when you're doing night things, for instance, and, and you think, oh, man, we're in trouble here. And then you get the film back and it was, it was fine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and I was young back then and, and relatively inexperienced. So I, you know, I constantly, we were pushing ourselves uh, particularly in the nice stuff and, and uh, d to work with not a lot of light. And I was always pleasantly surprised, um, you know, with what we got back on the film. And, and you know, uh, that even extended, not to change gears here, but on, on Moonrise Kingdom, it, we shot 16 millimeter. And if you s remember the film, there was the, the scenes where the, the little girl would be reading by firelight to the little boy out in the woods. And we would start shooting when there was still a little bit of light and we'd go until pitch black. And I always would guess, oh, it's the third to last take or whatever, but after that it was too dark. But it was amazing what even the 16 millimeter film would dig out, you know, and uh, we'd look at the dailies, I'm like, God, I can't believe we got that detail back there. <laughs> so, you know, it's a learning experience, but back to drugstore, uh, oh. you know, no, we, <laughs> we kind of, it all kind of worked out the way we wanted. and. Um, you know, I was a little concerned, you know, with all the green walls and everyone was wearing green and that was kind of the palette that Gus had chosen. And so I was constantly off camera putting four by eight, you know, foam cores up against the walls that you don't see just so when we get less green light bouncing around the room and, you know, things like that. You know, but, mm. uh, <laughs> it, was, it was all, it all kind of worked out what we wanted, I think. You know, we were all pretty happy. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, in a, in a general kind of conversational piece, you've actually really continued to shoot quite a bit of film when, you know, a majority of the industry has transitioned over pretty much completely digital. Uh, but yeah. you've, you've done both and you've kind of maintained a great balance of that. And do you, do you find any challenges still shooting film this day, these days, or is it, is it uh, as easy and are you getting the same results? That you uh, well, first of all, you, you get a great deal of resistance from the producers when you say you want to shoot film. Yeah, that's the first battle you have to fight. And you, you need the director on board. Uh, like when I did Love and Mercy, um, I, you know, I, I said, this is a movie that should be shot analog, not, you know, digitally. And we really should shoot film for this. And then I took it a step further. I said we should uh, uh, shoot. Oh, thank you. Um, my wife's bringing me some more tea. Thank Very you. Nice. <laughs> uh, I said uh, we really should shoot 16 for the Paul Dano stuff and 35 for the John Cusack stuff. And of course, the producers were like, "What? You know, you got to be crazy." But Bill Pola, the director, uh, was on board, and I shot some tests, and he loved the tests. And uh, and back then, it was a little more expensive to shoot film. I don't know what the breakdown mm -hmm. is today. Um, and I I was one of the original. I was one of the cinematographers who came into the digital world, kind of kicking and screaming the whole time. And uh, you know, ah, I don't like digital. I don't like digital. I'm a film person. But I've come to embrace. Uh, digital quite quite a lot now and I love you know the Alexa I love the way the Alexa looks I've been using the Alexa and and you know in the certain situations uh, you know particularly in low light nights uh, nights on the street whatever you know the digital cameras are, are you know kind of uh, outperform film in a lot of ways and so and you can certainly get beautiful looking images from both so I think it depends on the project like when I work with Wes Anderson, uh, you know, he, you know, he shoots film and that's his choice. And there's no, no, you know, no question about it. And, uh, you know, certain other things, if the director is on board, then you can usually shoot film, but, you know, um, I think part, you know, no, uh, insult to the labs today, but you know, the, the, the film, when you shoot film, there's always this kind of, you know, because you can't see what you're getting, there's a little bit of, you know, you know, fear that there might be a problem, you know, and uh, 
occasionally things will happen with the stock or you know with the processing or whatever and and so it's it can it it, it can be a little you know scary sometimes and, and the nice thing about for me digital is you know by the end of the day i can get in my car and go home and not be worried about that 5 a.m phone call <laughs> you know but by the way there was a scratch in the, the entire mag and this and that you know which it was the ultimate nightmare for cinematographers but it's a different look and i love film and um i recently have been going through uh my old boxes in the garage of photos i've taken of movies if, if you check out my instagram you'll see them. And it's amazing, uh, I've been scanning them and, and uh, you know, when you have the film, it has such a different uh, uh, look to it than the digital and it's just two different animals and they're both great. So mm. that's a long winded way of answering your question. Yeah, yeah. no, I, th I think, you know, you going back to that conversation about psychology again, right? It, there's definitely, when the film comes up, your mind shifts over to a different kind of world in a way. Different, different feeling, a different look, and and it's not always appropriate. But in certain things like Love and Mercy, I think it worked out pretty well, particularly the sixteen. And, and yeah. I argued too that not only the look, but just when you're so much of what we did was handheld with the sixteen, and you know when you handhold the sixteen millimeter camera, the, the the moving of the camera is different than if you handhold an Alexa. I mean, you know, and, and you know, and it's just everything about it is a little bit different feeling, and I think that. Uh, it all adds up to a different uh, 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 look and emotion on screen. Yep. So, yeah. And then wor working with another, you know, I would say just iconic person in the indie film world, Noah Baumbach, and doing Squid and the Whale yeah. together. And that was 16 as well, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. And, and uh, part of that was well, that was for two reasons. One being budgetary. That movie was made for $1.5 million. Wow. And we shot it in 24 days or something like that. And we shot in Brooklyn and Park Slope. And, uh, you know, uh, Noah, uh, we wanted a lot of it. He, Noah was a huge fan of, of uh, the French New Wave. And, uh, and he kind of wanted that style to the film. So, you know, I generally lit things more in a general way than a specific way. And we allowed the actors to kind of not have to hit specific marks. You know, I mean, they kind of had to hit marks, but if they missed their marks, we weren't going to say, hey, no, you missed your mark. You know, I, I would I would adjust because I was hand holding the camera. So it gave the actors a lot of room to move around. And, and uh, I was, uh, you know, I took it as a great compliment at the end of the movie, Jeff Daniels, who you see there, came up to me and said, I've never felt more freedom as an actor to do what I want on a movie. <laughs> and, I, and I took that as a huge compliment. And, uh, you know, uh, we just adjusted to them more than them adjusting to us. And, um, uh, but I think, so it was the freedom of the camera, the, the look of the French New Wave, and uh, basically a cost factor because back then, I don't, I don't even think there were, you know, digital cameras weren't really a, an option really back then. It was either 35 or 16. And, and so we went with the 16, which, and, and it, it just as an aside, you know, we did a, a photochemical finish on it. And, and, you know, back then people, DIs were becoming very uh, uh, fashionable. And I, and I wanted to do a DI and Noah said to me, if we do a DI, you're just going to go in and clean everything up and make it look perfect. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I was like, okay. So then, uh, then when I saw the finished film, you know, which we did photochemically, I, I, I called him and I said, you know, you're right. This was the way to go. It, uh, there's a certain character that it had that if I had gone in and put windows on everything and clean it all up, it probably wouldn't have had that. So sometimes it, less is more and it, and it kind of, keeps the original feeling and intent that we had with making the movie. And, and most cinematographers would want to go in and make it all perfect, you know, and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I had to let that one go. So <laughs> yeah, I think it was the right move. He made a good call. Yeah. No, it's a great film. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, how did you, how did you meet Paul and when did you, what was the first project you guys did together? Uh, we did Bridesmaids and I was, uh, uh, I had done a movie, called uh, Get Him to the Greek. 
and yeah. uh, with Nick Stoller and uh, Judd Apatow uh, uh, produced it. And we were uh, in the uh, uh, color correcting suite doing the, the, the color timing of the film and uh, Judd dropped by just to check it out being the producer. And I remember him turning to me and saying, hey, Bob, can I talk to you out privately in the hall for a moment? And I said, yeah, sure. You know? <laughs> so I go out in the hall and, and he said, well, I got this movie, uh, Bridesmaids, I'm producing this guy, Paul Feig, da, 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 you know, would you meet him? I said, okay, sure. So I met Paul for lunch, it was over the weekend. And he showed up very proper with his suit on and everything, you know, and I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> you know, uh, but we hit it off and Paul's a very sweet man. And, um, you know, uh, so, you know, we hit it off and I, I said, okay, yeah, you know, and, and uh, so that's, I, it was actually through Judd that I met Paul. And um, so we started shooting Bridesmaids and Judd was very involved as a producer and, you know, he was on set a lot, but, you know, Paul and I hit it off really well, and then we went on to do uh, The Heat, and then we did uh, Spy and and Ghostbusters, and um, it's quite a run. Know, it, it's he's a great guy, and we just kind of we have our I know kind of how he likes to shoot, and um, you know it's a lot of improv, so you're often shooting dueling cameras, you know, one on you looking this way and one on me looking this way, which is a cinematographer's nightmare, and. Um, but uh, because so many of the actors come from uh, improv comedy, Melissa McCarthy, Kristen Wiig, you know, um, you know, there they are, you know, uh, and they're, you know, it, it's like you sometimes have to, I won't say sacrifice because that's a terrible word, but, you know, maybe not light things exactly how you might want to because uh, in the service of, of the of the story and, and catching those moments. And um, so, uh, but the sets are always a lot of fun and there's a lot of laughs and, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's always a good time. It's just, you know, uh, it's always two cameras and, and usually they're pointing at each other <laughs> makes it a little <laughs> difficult but yeah but I've had a great time with Paul it's been yeah. a lot of fun you know that's that's kind of been a reoccurring I don't know theme message that we've been talking about for the last couple of months is how hard comedy is because it's not necessarily the first thing you know a cinematographer would gravitate to and then you deal with the challenges you just spoke about yeah about having you know comedy framing comedy lighting and being able to capture the performances in that moment yeah and they're always on you to add more cameras i remember one time we were doing this big scene and judd looks at me and says bob can we add another camera on Kristen?" i'm like oh shit oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah sure we can do that you know and uh you know, and, and for them, it's, it's, and obviously Paul cares about how his movies looks, he cares very much, but uh, for them, it's about capturing those moments and, and you know, they're, and I get it, so it's, it's hard to recreate comedy when, it, when someone's, you know, doing a, a, a improv type of thing, and, and there's, they do a great deal of improv on these films, and just let the actors roll and kind of discover the scene in a lot of ways. And they start with the script, but you know, everyone's uh, totally able to go off in another direction if that's what they want to do. And they just see where it takes them, you know? And uh, um, you know, it, I've learned a lot working on these films, just watching these, these improv people work and they're, they're so quick, you know, I, I just remember even on uh, Get Him to the Greek, Russell Brand, I mean, I was just so impressed by just how quick he was, <laughs> you know, and his, 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 his mind just works so quickly and, and just watching how the, you know, the, these actors improv and improv and how Russell would just go off in a whole different way. And, you know, it was just, I was like, whoa, you know, this guy's brilliant in a lot of ways. I mean, they all are, you know, Kristen Wiig, Melissa, they're all brilliant in their own way. Rose Byrne is another one. I mean, she, particularly in Get Him to the Greek, she had to, go toe to toe with Russell, which is not easy because he's out in left field most of the time. And just Rose could just handle it and come up with her own stuff. And, and she's just, she was brilliant. It was, it's, it's really fun working on these films, but you know, they can be a little uh, trying on you sometimes. As a <laughs> you know? Yeah, very cool. And it's, and you know, kudos to you because you have 
been able to, you know, be this chameleon. And like you were talking about, you know, shooting these films where you had to have more of a French wave kind of free flowing style and then go into these films that had to have a very classical way of shooting, but also all the challenges of capturing all that um, with improvisation involved. And then working with Wes Anderson, who's very specific. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, being able to cross those genres and do the work that you do, Bob, is, is amazing. You know, it's always fun to watch that. And so I, I'm curious, how do, you, how do you keep your identity or your stamp on this as you go through it? I mean, are you concerned about that? Are you thinking about that? Or um, Well, one thing that I has, I, I've been very conscious of is, is the films that I do. And, and after I had done Bridesmaids and, and Get Him to the Greek, um, it seemed like I got every script, comedy, you know, you know, being out there, and 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 I and like anything in the in the film industry, you get pigeonholed pretty quickly, and and uh, I didn't want to be pigeonholed, so I was careful, and and when Love and Mercy came along, I I, I jumped at it because I not only did I love the script, and I I really liked Bill Polad, the director, uh, but uh, it was just a whole other direction for me, and so I try to not do too many of the same genre things uh, in a row. And, and as I get older and towards the end of my career, I, I'm trying to do more interesting films as much as I can, you know, and, and not that, that these aren't interesting films, they are, but, you know, uh, I, I'm more drawn, to, when I go to watch films on TV or, or in the cinema, I'm more drawn to the indie style films, I think, mm. you know, and more personal stories uh, and, and, uh, you know, I tend to veer away from the blockbusters, you know, though I sometimes watch them, but, you know, it's more the, the personal smaller films that appeal to me. And that's kind of where I got started with Drugstore Cowboy and those types of films. And, um, it's kind of what I, I, I find personally the most satisfying working on those films, you know, so mm -hmm. that's kind of more, but I still do big, I mean, I did Mamma Mia too, which was a blast and we had a great time and, uh, but that's a big studio movie and, and big movie stars and all that. But it was a special kind of situation. The director, Al Parker, was wonderful. And, you know, we shot in London and Croatia. And, you know, it was it was like one of those movies that anybody who worked on it will tell you it was the great, most fun experience they ever had. <laughs> so, you know, so, it, you know, I bounced back and forth, I guess. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. Very cool. So format. You're, you've, you know, we've been talking about it now and you've, you've, you're showing that you're truly like a master of format and mixing formats and sometimes, you know, finding the right one for particular periods or like you said, emotions and this and that. Um, Moonrise Kingdom, obviously 16 millimeter, that was all the way through and that was just an amazing, amazing look. You know, it was incredible. I remember seeing that in the theater and going, this is so cool to see 16 millimeter projected again. And that was, um, as far as testing and making sure that you were getting the look that you wanted out of that, um, how deep down the road of testing do you go in the, in the pre-prep? Uh, well, with Wes, it's very extensive. <laughs> you know, uh, with some other directors, it's way less. Like when I did uh, uh, Love and Mercy, I, I got the 16 camera and we shot and then I went to a, 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 a di suite and i created a look and then we invited the director in bill to see it and and get his input you know and, and what we were hoping to achieve with the 16 and, and he embraced it quite well with wes uh we actually uh bring a film camera with us on the scouts uh and i function generally as the first ac loader camera operator. <laughs> I actually have to load the film and bring it out and, you know, and, and uh, I joke, I say, yeah, my AC must be the most expensive AC in the world if you're not going to bring him along. And, and I, I, like when we did Grand Budapest Hotel, we were shooting these shots of this car driving down a, a, a road at night. We shoot them at dusk, you know, in, in available light. And it was so cold. I mean, we were up on this bridge it was so freezing cold i mean it, and and 
the the film uh, we 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 shot several takes and then I had to change the mag and it, I mean anybody was there will tell you. I took my gloves off and my hands immediately froze and I was trying to load the film and it was an Airy 3 and I, uh, and I snapped the film and it was the last film that was uh, loaded and we were like, oh shit. And uh, luckily we got it on a weird take, but after that I got my AC. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we, we, we take a camera to all the locations and usually it's the production designers there and uh, our, our producer too, Wes, myself, some of the... Uh, PAs or drivers, whoever. And uh, we kind of block out the scenes and then either Wes or I will shoot them in, um, in available light. And we, we kind of do this quite frequently on West movies. Um, the other thing we do is we do a lot of color tests like in Grand Budapest, um, you know, our production designer, Adam, will have several flats point, uh, painted in different kind of shades of color. I mean, he's got a general idea of what Wes is looking for. And, and then we try to recreate the lighting as if it would be in a movie and, and we get people in the wardrobe wearing different shades of the purple jackets, walking across in front of these different shades of the uh, hotel. And it's very carefully, uh, you know, um, uh, worked out with him. I mean, incredibly, whereas he's the most, probably most, most testing we do is with Wes. We do a tremendous amount for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, and in Grand Budapest, you know, I, I think we have some stills to show too, but I, what I thought was really interesting is again, using the format. So jumping between four by three, one, eight, five, two, four, zero. Um, so that was obviously a mix of um, different, cameras, different lenses. Um, I would imagine yeah. you also use different film stocks and. Uh, no, we, we typically just shoot the, the Kodak uh, 200. I think it's 5213. I could be wrong. Um, but uh, he likes to just uh, shoot with the one stock and, and um, we, uh, you know, I, Periodically, I'll, I don't anymore, but I used to try to sell them on the fast stock. <laughs> but he <laughs> is very particular and he didn't want the fast stock. And he said, let's just use the same stock for the whole movie, you know, and, and he's right. So uh, that's what we do. And uh, it, it presents a certain amount of lighting challenges for me because, you know, the ASA is 200. So we, uh, you know, it requires more light than shooting Alexa at 800, obviously. And, and uh, so, um, and you can look at this particular shot, our whole lighting uh, plan, this was in the hotel lobby. You can see all the practicals in the background. And then up at the very top of the, it's five floors, there was this really beautiful skylight but we were shooting in Eastern Germany in January where it's dark all the time. So we put like, a, you know, 20 HMIs up there. We covered the skylight with a silk and just pounded the lights through the silk so we could maintain a constant even light uh, depending on, we could shoot at noon or we could shoot at midnight, it didn't matter. And then we, you can see the one of our electricians is holding a, a kind of a little fill light and uh, so that's how we lit it. We basically had the practicals in the background. We had the giant uh, skylight, which was on all the time. And then we would just bring in one little light like this or medium sized light and, and uh, um, you know, just kind of bring it up to the actors. And, and that's basically the style of lighting of the film, you know? Wow. Yeah. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. so now I have to ask about operating because you seem like you pretty much operate the camera and you said it's single camera and it's. <laughs> yeah. I, I operate all the f operate movies with Wes. I mean, one thing about Wes, he, he likes a small set. Uh, he, he doesn't like a lot of people around and it's very mi bare minimum. So oftentimes it's myself, there's a focus puller, our dolly grip uh, and a boom guy and Wes. And maybe uh, if Roman Coppola is there who comes to a lot of our shoots and does second unit, whatever. Roman's there, uh, and that's about it. He keeps the set really small. There's not an army of people standing around. He hates that, and you know I kind of embrace that as well. And so we try to keep, unless you're doing something actually on the set, probably you're asked to go somewhere else. And, and that's kind of how he runs it. And uh, there's no really video village or such. You know, like when you do some of these other big studio movies, there's like 
five or six giant villages around and there's all these people. But that's just the opposite. He has a little handheld monitor that's about this big that he holds with him and he kind of watches that and watches the actors. He watches that to make sure I'm not screwing up his shots and, you know, um, and he watches the actors and, um, you know, that's pretty much how we do it. It's, it's a very small a group of people on set, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, you know, looking at, I mean, I, obviously I haven't worked with him directly, but, you know, from what I've seen, what I've read, you know, everything is very, very precisely storyboarded, illustrated in a way. And, um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of what I've heard Hitchcock works, you know, it's very yeah. specific, you know, so is he, is he even giving you notes on what focal length is being used here and so on and so forth? No. Or is that... Earlier on, uh, we tended to stick to one lens, uh, like on Rushmore and the uh, Royal Ten of Bombs was a 40 millimeter anamorphic. Mm. Uh, on Bottle Rocket, it was 27 spherical. Uh, but, you know, we kind of mix and match on the lenses a little bit, but basically how the process works is we, uh, you know, we, we visit the locations once we choose them and we have a, a pretty in-depth discussion about how we want to shoot it. And, and I always bring a finder with different lenses and we look through it and, uh, we talk, okay, it's the 50 right here, you know, and Sanjay, our grip, our wonderful grip, Sanjay, will kind of put a stake in the ground and, you know, uh, measure the height. And, and, and then Wes goes back and he has a guy who does these uh, animatics, uh, which are like these little cartoons. Mm. And uh, I think they have them now. I haven't seen the new Grand Budapest Blu-ray Criterion, whatever, but... I think they have a, uh, one of our animatics on there. So if you want, you're interested, you can check that out. And, and basically it kind of, uh, we've been doing this for a while now. It, it, it is a little cartoon characters. You need to show where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And he puts, the, and Wes does all the characters, uh, voices, which is always pretty amusing to me. And, um, <laughs> um, you know, we all kind of know exactly what the shot's going to be. And um, so, and then we lay it out pretty carefully and then, you know, he'll come to the set. Generally, I try to get there before him and get it all ready. And then he'll come to the set and he might fine tune things. Uh, you know, maybe instead of the 25, we, let's throw, let's look at a 21, you know? And, you know, I mean, he might change a little bit, but, you know, he definitely tends to the wider lenses. It's usually 18, 21, 25 in that, you know, very rarely do we use a long lens, but occasionally, but yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> But uh, so it's that's kind of the process. It's, it's visiting the the location, discussing the animatic, and then and he's pretty much sticks to the animatic. You know, it's 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 our bible. And whenever we're uh, on a set and we're not quite sure what's going on, he says, "Let's just get the animatic and take a look at it." And then we do, and he goes, "Okay, you know." And that's but we uh, what's good about this process is that it's very efficient, and and what makes his movies really inexpensively compared uh not only for the cast salaries but you know we, we we'll go to a, a, a an old uh whatever location and, and he says this is what the camera's going to see i'm going to look this way i'm not going to look that way and so many uh directors that you work with want to see they don't know how they would they it might change you know the actors might want to go over there you know so they want to be able to look 360 degrees you know and so that means the art department has to you know do 360 degrees we have to light 360 degrees so you you, you know it, it takes more time more money you know blah 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 Whereas with him, it's so specific, you know, you can see looking this way and behind me might be a pile of garbage, <laughs> but you know, you're never going to see that. So you don't have to worry about cleaning it up. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, we're going this way, not that way, you know, and, and it's, it makes it very efficient and, and everybody knows what we're going to be doing. The prop people bring just the props they need for this particular side. And, um, and so we can shoot very quickly and very efficiently by doing yeah. it that way. Now, I, I got to tell you, as soon as the, the, the teaser and the trailer came out for the French Dispatch, I was just, I was hooked. I cannot wait to see this film. I mean, it looks, 
it looks incredible and just wild and crazy and everything we, you know, get excited about going to the cinema for. And, yeah. um, what I noticed is again, very similar in a way to Grand Budapest. There's a lot of different formats, black and white color, uh, changing all that out. Um, what did you guys, did you guys go a different route on this one? Did you do anything? Yeah. Different uh, well, initially, basically there's, you know, it's a, it's several stories, but there's, you know, maybe four main stories. It's, it's different reporters uh, reporting on French life in a, a fictional magazine uh, that is sent back to the United States. And uh, each reporter has their own story about a different aspect of French life. And uh, we originally gonna shoot only one of them in black and white film. Uh, and the rest was going to be in color. And um, so we got the black and white film in prep and we would just sometimes go around to different locations and we would shoot black and white and color. And we, you know, when we look at the dailies, both of us and everyone else, you know, was like, wow, that black and white is so cool, you know? And it, it had a quality to it as much as I love the color, but it had a quality to it that, you know, we both just fell in love with. So we ended up shooting way more of it in black and white than we originally intended. <laughs> but, you know, Wes, you know, he has no problem mixing color and formats. And, and here you go. This was, you know, uh, anamorphic. And, and uh, he, uh, I think he used it for certain scenes and for other scenes he uses it uh, for uh, uh, emphasis or to like there's a scene where Benicio del Toro is is an artist and uh, he's painting these paintings in prison and, and uh, everything was shot here you go it's a uh, shot 137 and um, uh, but then when he reveals his paintings not to ruin the movie I shouldn't say this because you know I Wessel can be but you know we, we can jump to color and and things that kind of have a much more dramatic effect you know and, and, and so, you know, it's, it's, uh, he uses color sparingly in a lot of these movies, but in a very dramatic moment that might, and, and maybe you jump from 137 to 240, and all of a sudden it's just like, you know, instead of just duh, 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 bang, you know, and, and I think it has a really strong impact on people watching the movies. And so we often used it that way. And, uh, you know, he makes the call what, what he wants. And, you know, we just say, color black and white you know and and uh you know sometimes it's something that he you know we hadn't planned on but you know he kind of you know we ended up using a lot more black and white but we certainly <laughs> most of the movies one through seven but, you know we do all kinds of different stuff you know it depends on the, what's going on you know very cool and did you so you shot true black and white negative did you test yeah. color negative and then going to black and white or was it always we didn't even uh we did test it but uh the black and white negative had a contrast to it and a, a, a grain and uh it just had this incredible feeling to it that we both were like wow and, and when we bring people into the editing we watched our dailies at, in the editing room in, at our hotel and they're on a giant flat screen and whenever we'd bring like the costume designer or the production designer or someone come, hey, you go and check out the dailies, come on in. And uh, they would always look at it and go, whoa, <laughs> you know, because the black and white just had this amazing feeling to it. And, and uh, you know, I, I loved it personally, you know, and, and uh, it just, it, you know, it, 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 I'm a big fan of those old black and white films. And, and sometimes it, you have to add a little bit of, backlight or something to separate the actors you know you had to be a little more careful on the lighting a little bit but I, you know i tried to start off kind of lighting it like color and then if i saw something i would add a little accent somewhere or something that you would need to do it but you know it was yeah. it was a lot of fun I, I i had a blast doing it you know it was, it was really fun <laughs> <laughs> that's cool yeah i just can't wait to see this film it's really exciting <laughs> yeah well i hope you like it <laughs> yeah, that's great and, you know, I, here it comes, the question you always get asked, right? And that's how yeah. do you do those amazing swish pants? <laughs> uh, well, basically, it all, uh, um, the key to, uh, typically when I operate, I use a gearhead. 
but for the swish pans, I use a fluid head. And the key to it is setting your feet in a really comfortable position for the end, the end part. And, and so, you, you know, at the beginning, you're kind of twisted all around in a really awkward position. And then you turn and you hit, you know, this way and, and you find your where it feels really comfortable and you always hit the same mark, you know, and, and, or close, you know. And so I've been doing it that way forever. And, you know, people say, why don't you use hot gears or one of these other, you know, and, and I know Wes would be against that. He, he likes everything to be kind of more you know, like we can't use technical frames or things like that, you know. So um, it, it's, it's got to be, you know, more in the spirit of the French New Wave, I think. And, and so he likes that. And occasionally I miss, you know, I mean, yeah, I do miss some sometimes, but, you know, I, I hit it pretty often. And, and um, you know, it's basically put your feet in the most comfortable position for the end, then you twist yourself like a pretzel and then find that as you come back, you know, and, and that works, you know, I tell people that one time I, we were doing a shot uh, in, in uh, Grand Budapest and it's towards the end of the movie where everybody's on the top floor of the hotel and they're all coming out of doors and firing guns and, and uh, we, we couldn't use a crane. So we built this scaffold, which went way, way up in the air and it was so, uh, uh, tippy because they couldn't support it that well. And, and, and I, I was the only one that could be on it because it was too much weight. And, and I had to do these fast moves. Let me turn that one off, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, and, and I had to do these fast moves and, 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 as I, and, as I, and they had to do a 360. So as I was moving around, I, I, I was shaking the whole thing, you know? And I'm like, oh shit, what am I gonna do? And the actors are there. And, and I, and I thought of this old trick that I've seen a lot of people do, and I, I put a laser pointer uh, and, and uh, attached it to the, the head of the camera, and I pointed it at the floor. And so I put little X's with tape on the floor, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I capped the eyepiece, and I just went like, you know, and I operated this way, you know, with just standing there and just hitting the laser pointer. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, my heart was going like this. <laughs> Because I also had to do it on, on certain uh, lines of dialogue. So I had to memorize the dialogue, of course, and because I couldn't be reading it and operating at the same time. And so I, you know, Rafe comes out the door, da 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 da, bang, da 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 da, bang, da 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 da, you know, and, and so that's kind of how I did it. And uh, I, I was never more scared of doing a shot in my life. And, you know, I think we ended up doing like 19 takes or something. And, like finally, finally Wes was like, all right, we got it. We got it. I'm like, oh, God, thank God. <laughs> that was one of the hardest shots I've ever done in my life. You know? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I want to see the behind the scenes. Out. There's probably no behind the scenes. But it must have been uh, well, he keeps it pretty spare. Occasionally, <laughs> the behind the scenes people, there's always a guy with a video camera. Occasionally, they let him in, but many times, uh, Wes just says, oh, everybody get out of here. You know, he doesn't want any distractions. <laughs> But occasionally, you know, so maybe there was one for that. One for that. You know, it was, I just had to think fast because as I moved around that, that tower, it was going like this, you know, yeah. and, and oh, that man. wasn't going to work. And, and so by using the laser pointer, and I'm not the first person to ever do that. I, you know, other people have used laser. Dolly grips do it all the time when they have to make specific, you know, particularly on a dance floor, when you have to do a specific hit, you know, moving around a dance floor and you have to, hit specific marks. I've seen dolly grips to it. So I said, oh, geez, I could just put X's down on the ground. And, you know, um, I would just, and I numbered them. So I go, oh, I'm at three. I got to get to four next. <laughs> you know, and that's all I did. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> well, Bob, I, I can't believe an hour's already gone by. This has oh, been wow. so much fun. But I think on a closing note, you know, we have a lot of uh, really great young filmmakers in our audience, you know, and I think they always like to hear any sort of advice you have for them as they get started in their career. Oh, and okay. what, what would you say is, you know, what's your advice to those folks? And um, Okay, I have a little bit of advice. Well, when I started uh, back in the late 70s, we, it was film only, so we couldn't practice, you know. I mean, if you, if you get out of school, you have no money, you know, and so you have to go rent a camera from expensive places like Airy Rental. <laughs> I'm just kidding, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, but you had to rent a camera and you had to buy film and you had to process the film and, and you know, it, it was it was quite an expense. And, and 
you know, no one could afford to do that. So you really couldn't practice your craft. But in today's world with digital cameras, anybody can do it. You can shoot on your iPhone. I mean, you know, and we, um, you know, these, you can buy inexpensive cameras, you know, whatever. And, and I would just say, go out and shoot anything you can. And, uh, you know, as much as you can and learn from that. My daughter is a, a senior in college and she has a camera and she's it, during this uh, uh, quarantine, she, there's a thing called shot deck that Lauren Shear made up and, and, and it's like, they take iconic shots from movies. And, and so you can go through and try to recreate those at home, you know, and recreate that lighting. And, and I have a couple of Kinos and LED lights that I've accumulated over the years. So she spends her time doing that and, and it's quite a learning experience for her, you know? And, and so I think kids today ha have the opportunity to shoot, which is something we didn't have because of the expense of it all, you know? And so just shoot as much as you can, watch old movies and, and just think about where did they put the camera? Watch the blocking of the actors. Like I recently watched uh, Key Largo, uh, John Huston film. And a lot of it takes place in a big room and they have all these actors, but just watch how they move the actors around and they, they create a really visual, beautiful visual style by just the blocking of the actors. Rather than having everyone just sitting at a table, not moving, they, they're all moving around the room quite a bit. And it, it's really, you know, just watch the old movies and the old masters and study lighting. Uh, I love still photography. Look at books of stills and go to museums and watch. Look at paintings. You know, you just absorb as much as you can. You know, and, and that, that you know, there's so much out there and there's so many opportunities now that we didn't get. So uh, you know, I, I would you know back when I uh, started, we, we couldn't even get VHS machines. You know, I mean, you had to see a movie. You had to go to the movie theater. You know, now with DVDs and behind the scenes and the directors talking about things. There's so many more things that are available to you and just take advantage of all that. Yeah, that's awesome, Bob. Thank you so much. It was great to spend Thanks. time with you. Great to see you. And uh, hopefully we'll be talking again soon. I hope so, my friend. <laughs> all right, take care. Thank you. Right. Right. And thank you to everybody that joined us today. Um, please join us again this Friday. We're going to be sitting down with cinematographer Terry Siegel and talk about her career and uh, her work. And uh, all of our episodes will be available on our website, airyrental.com, where you can check out those and all of our unique and exciting products that we offer. And you can also follow us on youtube.com forward slash airyrentalgroup. All right, everybody, until next time, cheers. <laughs>